What if I told you the Houston Museum of Natural Science had an amazing off-site facility featuring over 2.5 million artifacts, some of which have never been seen? What if I told you today I was going to give you a tour of that facility? I'm joined by Lisa Rabori. I'm the Senior Vice President of Collections and Exhibitions at the museum, and I am so happy to be showing you around today. She's going to make sure I'm on my best behavior. Now, I get a sort of Hangar 51 vibe from Indiana Jones in here. There's a lot of things in here that you guys have never seen before. Uh, tell me about this building. So this building was built about 10 years ago when we were expanding the museum to hold our new Paleontology Hall and Weiss Energy Hall. Part of our goal was to make sure everything in Herman Park was actually available and open to the public. So the permanent collection storage uh, was moved off-site and we have this great building that we use to hold all of our inventory for new exhibits and artifacts that came to us many, many years ago that we no longer have on exhibit. And so all of our caretaking for the museum's collections happens here. And now everything is filed away very intricately. It's climate controlled, it's a little chilly in here. And everything it has its own place. Very true, very true. So all of the collections are grouped together. So we have light collections assembled in different parts of the building. The building is uh, to museum standards for climate control, filtered air, and, and high security, of course. Everything we need to preserve the collections for future generations. Yeah, you can't just walk in here. It's not like the museum. You can't just walk in and say, hey, I want to go look at things. But we do have an opportunity uh, available. There are tours offered through our adult education department. Like I'm getting right now. Now, when I say that we have 2.5 million artifacts, what I didn't say is that some of these are very, very, very small, like these beetles here. Yes, what's so amazing about these beetles is their size, but also that each one of them requires about two hours worth of work to process. And that Some of those are no bigger than a fingernail or a crumb from a cookie. Correct, correct. The processing becomes more challenging because each one has a label which identifies it with our permanent little, records. Little tiny handwriting. I am so amazed by the patience and the dedication of the entomologists who work with us. Now, a lot of the things at our off-site facility are just waiting for an exhibition, just waiting to be shown, kind of like these shells. Well, actually, these shells, these haliotis, were part of what was considered for inclusion in our new Hall of Malacology, and they didn't make the cut. But they are still in our collections and very valuable. Um, and very pretty. And very pretty, yes. So you can see some of these shells have uh, the cleaned exterior, and others have their natural exterior. But haliotis are specifically known because of their iridescent interior. Some of you may actually see some uh, familiar faces inside our storage facility as well. Some of these are specimens, big taxidermy pieces that have been retired from museum uh, view. They saw many good years at the museum, but as we change our exhibits out, we have new specimens we can show, and uh, that doesn't mean we get rid of our old specimens. We bring them here for retirement. So they just sort of hang out here. So there's the big polar bear and the lions and the tigers and the bears. And, and they will probably find another exhibition life in the future. So I can't put this one in my office. You have an office big enough for this? Well, it's more like a glorified cube. Now, there are countless pieces of taxidermy here at our facility. And we don't just have these things because they look cool. We have these things for a reason. Well, we have an educational reason, educational exhibition reason at the museum, but we also have a social and scientific reason for preserving these for the future. Some of these items have been in our possession since 1943, and they're possibly the, the last specimens of some of these birds. Yes, this uh, collection of hummingbirds was acquired by the museum in the 40s, and it came to us from Brazil, a collector in Brazil. And what's so important about this collection now is that it does document the uh, biology of, of Brazil. And since they had that awful fire a couple years ago, um, collections like this are that much more important. This guy used to live at the Houston Zoo back in the 1940s, which means your grandparents probably saw him on a field trip. He looks like a mean puppy. 
Uh, but he's a sweet one because he really speaks to the collaboration between museums and zoos from around the world, especially around the United States. So it is one person's loss, one institution's loss is another's gain. And we will provide, uh, continue the educational mission of these animals. Now let's go downstairs and check out some of the cultural artifacts that we have in storage. Now, as you guys know, the museum was founded in 1909, but we didn't start keeping expert records until 1929. And that's what we're looking at right now, back when the museum was called the Houston Museum of Natural History. At that time, we were part of the city parks department and the museum was actually in a building at the zoo that was located in the then new Herman Park. So this ledger book has the early history of the museum's collections. Wow, and this is all handwritten. It's all handwritten, yeah. Do we have a record of what the very, very first item was here at the museum? Well, we can look and see, huh? Let's see that. The very first item listed is a gold quartz from Australia donated by Sigmund Westheimer. The same Westheimer that we all know and love as the big street in Houston. Westheimer Road, yeah. I think there's a picture of him there. This is Mr. Sigmund Westheimer. Now, big question, where did all this stuff come from that was coming into our collection? Well, at this time, the Port of Houston was, develop was being really developed, and Houston was an international city. So there were uh, many boats coming in and out of the ports from all over the world, and many people from Houston going out all over the world. Folks, this is George H. Herman. Herman Park, Herman Hospital, one of the key men that made Houston what it is today. All right, so this piece of paper here, signed by George Herman, it looks very important. What exactly is that? So this is the only copy we have of one of the kind of membership forms for the early museum. And this is his membership in, George Herman's membership in the Houston Scientific Society, which was responsible for the museum. So the future of the museum basically resides in this piece of paper. He was one of our earliest supporters, yes. So folks, when you become a member of the Houston Museum of Natural Science, you're in a group with this guy. The Houston Museum of Natural Science has a wide collection of Native American artifacts. And in fact, in the next few years, we're gonna to be totally renovating our Hall of Americas. And some of these pieces actually might be on display. We're looking at uh, these really great, intricate Native American shoes, moccasins. Indeed. We have several drawers of moccasins that um, we have acquired from various collectors over the years, representing various groups and um, certainly representing all across uh, America. Some of my favorites are the ones with the American flags that are reinterpreted in the beadwork. And then also one of the things that I enjoy is the evidence of somebody actually wearing and using these pieces. And so some of these moccasins were worn so much that you can see the footprints on the bottom. Now, a lot of you guys are gonna be sad to hear this, but we are not hoarding a herd of dinosaurs over here at our storage facility. What we have on display is the best stuff we have. It is. These are just fragments of things that one day might find a place. So um, the, frag the bone fragments that you see here are used for reference and for education purposes. And at a point in our past, these were the best that we had. Obviously now, our best fossils are residing at Herman Park. Now the museum also has one of the world's largest collections of Amazonian artifacts, including some of these things here. We're really so thrilled to have this collection. Um, and several of these pieces will in fact go on display in the New Hall of the Americas. Um, what's so fabulous about them is not only the, the intricacy of the craftsmanship and the cultures that are being represented by these pieces, um, what I find particularly intriguing is that they were actually meant to be worn and carried. So you can't get the true impact of some of these pieces unless you actually saw them being worn in these ceremonies. Correct. We've had the privilege of um, being given several videos that were taken by anthropologists in the field, and they actually s show similar pieces being worn, and all the feathers are bouncing up and down, and there are uh, dangly bits that are that are like rattles. There's seed pods and beetle shells, and um, it adds a whole other dimension to these pieces that we see here. 
Now you old time fans of the Houston Museum of Natural Science probably remember seeing these lions out front in the parking lot. This was one of the first things you saw when you went to the museum when it was at the zoo. Correct. So these guys here have been around. They have seen many generations of children. There was actually a uh, call in for photographs of kids on the lions back in the 40s. And so we have a small collection of those images in our archives. Now how did this guy lose his face? Oh, it was a cold winter. It, uh, the rain got in a crack on his nose and then it froze and his nose popped off. So when you saw these lions, when you're walking up to the museum, you knew that you were in for a good time. You were at the Museum of Natural Science, yes. And now this guy here has a little bit of a pink tinge to him. That um, was definitely not done at the museum. No, no, he, uh, he was kidnapped by a fraternity and um, received a coat of white paint. Oh. And then it was, uh, his location was identified to us and the fraternity returned him. But he did actually get a coat of white paint. See, look at his face, you can tell he's seen things. You have Molnir. you have Thor's hammer here, and we don't even have it on display. <sighs> Lisa, thank you for this amazing tour of our off-site facility. Guys, you can get a tour just like this by going to hms.org. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Craig, for coming out. I didn't even steal anything. I know. <laughs>